Good morning and welcome to worship with Willow Avenue Mennonite Church. Whether you are here with us in person or worshiping online, we are so glad that we can be together on this morning. If we haven't met before, I'm Audrey Hines, senior pastor here at Willow Avenue, where Jesus welcomes all and so do we. If you are with us on Facebook Live, we hope that you will consider joining us on Zoom. There should be a link in the comments in the description box below, and we want to welcome you to our Zoom community, which is warm and vibrant and welcoming. Today is the fifth Sunday after Epiphany. It's this season of light that we celebrate between Christmas and Lent. After today, we only have one more Sunday in this season. Epiphany is a season to bask in the beauty and wonder that God loved the world so much that God became one of us, experiencing the totality of birth, death, and new life. Today, we are grateful to our youth and children's pastor, Jerry Heiser Wanger, for her prayerful preparation of the homily this morning, even while away at Texas this week at a conference. Thank you, Jerry. As always, we welcome you to text your prayer requests, and those will be shared a little, aloud a little bit later in the service. And this, my friends, is the right number. 559-960-8777. <laughs> and the right number will be on all the slides that you will see coming up, so you can, you can begin texting your prayers anytime. And now I invite you to take a moment in silence to prepare your hearts and minds for worship. We invite you to stand in body or spirit and join us as we sing our opening hymn, number 80, We Sing to You, O God. We sing to you. Please be seated. I 
would like to invite the children to join me for a moment up front. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning. How are you all today? So um, I want to do a little bit of imagining with you. Do you think you can do some imagining with me? No? Yeah? Maybe? Okay. We're going to try it. So in a few minutes, you won't be in here anymore because uh, you'll be going to Godly Play, but in a few minutes, we're going to read an old story that the people of Israel heard that reminded them of an even older story about a time when God rescued them, and it talks about an eagle and an eagle's wings and riding up on an eagle. And I wonder, can you imagine for a second, close your eyes, what would it be like to be rescued by an eagle? Can you imagine this? I wonder how big the eagle would have to be to rescue you. Big? Hmm. Okay. So I have something I want to show you, a little video clip that was about a story that rescued some people with eagles. Okay, so let's watch this little video clip. you tell how big those people that those eagles were gigantic they were even carrying someone right in their talons and being really gentle with somebody who was hurt so I just want you to remember that if you ever need help that God is so big like an eagle that could carry you and rescue you and that you can trust God to always help you okay because God is big enough to carry you like an eagle can carry someone on their back. Okay? Okay. So remember that we love you and God loves you. And we're so glad you're here. Okay? You get to go to Godly Play. Have a good rest of your morning. We'll see you later. As we unite our hearts together with God's in prayer for the church, community, and world, a reminder that all are welcome to text at prayer requests to 559-960-8777, and those will be shout, shared aloud in just a moment. And so now I invite you to turn in your hymnal to number 864 in your purple hymnal, and join with me in the prayer that is printed there. Now, the words will be on the screen, but I will also invite you to turn and face each direction as the prayer indicates, and I will give some help because our sanctuary is oriented northwest, and it makes finding north, south, east, west a little bit tricky when you're inside. So I invite you to stand and join me with number 864. And when we get, after we pray the prayer facing north, I'll pause to offer any of the prayers texted to me, and then we will conclude with the prayer facing center. We offer thanksgiving to our creator, recalling that Christ is the center of creation and our lives as Christians. As we face east, the direction of the rising sun, we offer thanks for the gifts of the tree world and for new beginnings. Help us to be honest with you and others and to be wise and just in our use of the resources of the earth. We give thanks to you, O oh God. As we face south, where we receive warmth we offer thanks for the gifts of the animal world and for the call to be humble. 
Enable us to walk good paths, to live as families should, and with you to renew the face of the earth. We give thanks to you, O God, as we face west, where we receive teachings of faith. We offer thanks for the gifts of the rock world and the purifying and fruitful waters. Sustain us and the earth through your Holy Spirit and give us faith as strong as the rock. We give thanks to you, O God, as we face north, the direction of wind and snow. We offer thanks for the plant world and for kindness and wisdom. Breathe your strength and endurance into us and give us wisdom to treat each other with kindness. We give thanks to you, O God. As we face the center of the room. From above comes the unconditional love of God. From the earth comes the gift of life. We give thanks for love like the wings of the eagle. We dedicate our lives to you, our creator and savior. As we walk on this earth, may we learn together and celebrate the way of peace, harmony, and tranquility. We give thanks to you, O God. Amen. You may be seated. Once more, for the Lord is my light, dancing is allowed. Sit down, please. Please be seated. (laughs) 
I'm reading from Isaiah 40, verses 21 through 31. Don't you know? Haven't you heard? Wasn't it announced to you from the beginning? Haven't you understood since the earth was founded? God inhabits the earth's horizon. Its, its inhabitants are like locusts, stretches out the skies like a curtain and spreads it out like a tent for dwelling. God makes dignitaries useless and the earth's judges into nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown. Scarcely is their shoot rooted in the earth when God brings on, breathes on them and they dry up. The windstorm carries them off like straw. So to whom will you compare me? And who is my equal, says the Holy One? Look up at the sky and consider, who created these? The one who brings out their attendants one by one, summoning each of them by name. Because of God's great strength and mighty power, not one is missing. Why do you say Jacob? And why do you say Jacob and Israel and declare Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My God ignores my predicament. Don't you know? Haven't you heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He doesn't grow tired or weary. His understanding is beyond human reach, giving power to the tired and reviving the exhausted. Youths will become tired and weary. Young men will certainly stumble. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strengths. They will fly up on wings like eagles. They will run and not be tired. They will walk and not be weary. May we find God's wisdom in these words. Amen. Would you join me in singing number 287, Jesus Christ is Waiting. We'll sing verses one, four, and five. Jesus Christ is waiting, waiting in the streets. No one is his neighbor, all alone he eats. Listen, Lord Jesus, I am lonely too. Make me friend or stranger, fit to wait on you. Jesus Christ is dancing, dancing in the streets, where each sign of hatred he with love defeats. Listen, Lord Jesus, I should triumph too. Where good conquers evil, let me dance with you. Jesus Christ is calling, calling in the streets. Who will join my journey? I will guide their feet. Listen, Lord Jesus, let my fears be few. Walk one step before me, I will follow you. Yeah. 
The New Testament reading today comes from the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 1 reflects on the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. He's preaching, he's uh, speaking in the synagogues, calling disciples, and I'm sure many other things. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew and James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve him. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Isn't that an interesting phrase? In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. And he answered, Let us go to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is why I came. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. May this become God's word for us today. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Good morning. I love to tell stories. Sometimes I'm amazed at how often I am tempted to break out in a story, especially if that story is entertaining and makes me look good. Some stories, though, come out of a crisis, perhaps an individual crisis or a communal crisis. And the story will often take shape when particular questions are asked. Who are we? Where do I fit? Where are we going from here? Out of these questions, we may form an identity that is revealed in the stories that we then tell. And because things change, we either have to tell different stories or we have to tweak the story that we tell. When life is moving along at a steady pace, our stories will follow, follow accordingly perhaps adjusting it with little changes, because all is well. Normally, we can keep up with ourselves, but when a drastic change occurs, the stories we tell of ourselves, of our people, will change accordingly. When Dean and I arrived in Fresno in November of 2021, our first Sunday we came here, it was a new story for us. This congregation was already in the midst of a changing and growing story, a story of identity, a story of transformation. So in preparing for the message this morning, I did some search, and I found a piece in the Anabaptist world written in November of 2021 and saw these words spoken by our own Lynn Jost. He says of the Willow Avenue Mennonite Church at that point, from its inception in the 1960s, the congregation has tried to offer a place where difficult questions can be addressed, sometimes in ways that open doors for other MBs. He said, the conversation regarding inclusion flows out of the congregation's decades old mission statement to follow Jesus Christ daily and radically, be it an inclusive community without discrimination. Thanks, Lynn. 
This was an important moment in the story of this congregation. And though I missed most of the story, I've heard enough to know that the story was individual and it was communal. It's a story of belonging and inquiring and transforming. I've heard the stories and it's clear that the change didn't come quickly. And not everyone was happy all of the time. And throughout the process, there was a lot of listening, a lot of praying, discussing, maybe some disagreeing, and working together. And the story was being written and perhaps rewritten and continues to be written. Isaiah tells a story of a people in crisis. The ancient Israelite people told stories of a trustworthy God who had chosen them, a God who took care of them, a God who freed them from oppression. They were the people in relationship with God. God was their identity, and they understood God as a God of strength and steadfastness. And then the tables were turned. The Babylonian Empire defeated them in battle, destroyed the city, left them without leadership, left them without hope. And it was into this emptiness and loss of identity that the prophet Isaiah spoke the words in chapter 40, reminding them that their store, of their stories and of their God. Isaiah connected the ancient to their present. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the very beginning? They needed, perhaps like we need sometimes, to be reminded of who God is. That God is eternal and God is powerful and the rulers of the earth are not. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground that he blows on them and they wither and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. The people felt abandoned by God, but Israel brings them, or Isaiah brings them back to their own stories. Have you not heard? Then he reminds them that humans get weary, that we get weary. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, he says. They shall mount up their wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And what a beautiful image of that we received with the children. It's an old story. It's an old story of crisis and hope and encouragement. It was a story retold in order to give the people back their identity in a time of change. The crisis in our Isaiah text was one of defeat and exile. The crisis when Jesus started his ministry was the Roman Empire and its dominance over the Jewish territories. So we move to Mark. Jesus' story begins in Capernaum, where on the Sabbath, while in the synagogue, he is teaching and casting out evil spirits. Soon after leaving the synagogue, Jesus and his first four disciples go to Simon's home, where they learn that Simon's mother-in-law is in bed with a fever. Jesus goes to her, takes her hand, helps her up. The fever is gone. So that evening, when the Sabbath had ended, crowds of people arrived at the, door, at the house to be healed, seeking Jesus. Like many of these, like likely many of these people were poor and vulnerable because they were sick, or they were sick because they were poor and vulnerable. Healing passages may make some of us squirm a little. They remind us that the Bible is an ancient text from a different worldview. Not only is Jesus healing on the Sabbath, but he's upsetting the social order. And that's an important part of the story. Reverend Sarah Barron of the United Methodist Church in Schenectady, New York, says this. 
If we, as people of faith, try to focus on those needing healing from our 21st century eyes, we will look at the symptoms and the diseases and get distracted by our own theories of healing. In doing so, we can miss the symbolism that brings the greatest meaning. Illness isn't actually as simple as the moderns like to think of it. It's more than physical symptoms. Illness itself is perceived culturally and has cultural impacts. Of course, it impacts those who, is, those who are ill, but it is also understood within the stories of time and place. Stories, she says, form around particular illnesses, often quite potent ones. Worse yet, illness serves to distance the individual from their community. So, understanding the stories of Jesus' healing requires us to enter into a perspective of illness at that time and of that place. When a person was healed, they were enabled to rejoin society. It allows them to take a higher and safer place in the hierarchy of society. This must have been really aggravating to the powers that be. Because by healing, Jesus is raising the downtrodden and diminishing the power of the powerful. Thus, the stories of healing by Jesus serve to reclaim God's identity, to disrupt the narratives of the empire, to restore the identity of the Palestinian people. What I think Jesus was doing is kicking up some dust. Jesus was changing the story. And it takes courage to follow Jesus, to confront and challenge the injustices that surround us. Isaiah and Mark's story speak of change. They speak of remembering, of confronting, and of being a part of the healing. Writing the story where the forgotten are acknowledged and the sick are made whole, perhaps even causing us to kick up some dust and challenge the system when justice injustice is at play. Like Isaiah's brilliant writing in chapter 40, we need to connect to the stories of the past and respond to our present so that we can better recognize God. May we pay attention May we hear the stories again and again of how God moved, how God moves in our lives, how God is helping us write and rewrite our personal and our communal story. Like the Israelites, may we remember where we came from and where we're headed. What was the passion that drove this community to be inclusive? to ask the tough questions, to face the injustices, to be transformed. May we remember that. And may our story continue to be written as we grow in understanding of God and our identity as God's people. Finally, as we turn toward the communion table this morning, let us hear once again the final words in our text from Mark. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he, played, where he prayed. No doubt Jesus was tired. He was met with one crisis after another. So when no one was looking, he sneaked away, went to that quiet place where he could just simply rest in God's presence. Bask in God's decadent love, for the story was being told. Jesus was telling the story, the story that we are all a part of. As we continue our journey, may we continue to listen to God's voice, to pay attention, to consider where we came from, to see where God is leading us as we write and rewrite our story. May it be so. Amen.
Number 797, we are people of God's peace. This year, Ash Wednesday falls on Valentine's Day. While the origins of Valentine's Day are obscure at best, it is a day firmly embedded in American culture that, for better or worse, has connected a saint of the church with the expression of love and affection. I'm not entirely opposed to this. While we should, of course, make a regular habit of telling friends and loved ones how much we love and appreciate them, the holiday provides an occasion for recounting our story of our relationships and affection, which builds our trust in one another as we move forward together. So if, like me, you find yourself rolling your eyes just a bit at the idea of Valentine's Day, and especially talking about it at church, hang with me for just a moment. Because I believe that when God thinks of us, each of us, that God's heart swells with love and affection to the point of overflowing. It reminds me of the 2007 novel, The Shack, where God has a habit of referring to every individual as someone that God is especially fond of. Once when God says this, the main character, Mac, asks, whether a particular person is God's favorite. God replies, I have no favorites. I'm just especially fond of him. You seem to be especially fond of a lot of people, Mac observed with a suspicious look. Are there any you are not especially fond of? After careful consideration, God replies, nope, haven't been able to find any. God knows your story. God knows our story. God has been with us since the beginning, 
and will be with us come what may. And so that's why today we're celebrating the decadent love of God with port wine or pomegranate juice and gluten-free brownies for all. Because the decadent love of God is for everyone. It's for you, it's for me, it's for the person you can't stand, and it has nothing to do with being worthy. God is especially fond of you, period. This is important to accept because communion is a meal that nourishes followers of Jesus for a life of service to one another and the world. It's hard to share that love if we're not overflowing with it ourselves. At the table of Christ, we eat this bread and drink this cup to remember the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, to be united with Christ and with one another as the church, and to look forward to a time when all will be one. As we eat and drink with thanksgiving, Jesus Christ is present with us. And we are empowered by the Spirit to follow Jesus' way of love as the body of Christ, broken and blessed for the life of the world. Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, When you share bread together, remember me. We should have a slide with... There it is. Blessed are you, abundant God, for you made bread to strengthen us. You gave us this bread as a sign of your body. Let our sharing be a taste of the bread of heaven that feeds the world. Amen. And Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant. When you drink it together, remember me. Blessed are you, bountiful God, for you made the fruit of the vine to nourish us. You gave us this cup as a sign of your blood. Let our sharing be a taste of the wine we shall drink in your joyful feast. Amen. So in just a moment, we will invite you to come forward and receive a blessing with these gifts of bread, brownie today and cup from the table. As always, wine is in the back and juice is in the front and all of the brownies are gluten-free. Please hold the elements until we have formed a circle all the way around the sanctuary. And when all who wish to participate in this meal have come, we will eat and drink together with our community online, showing the Zoom gallery on the screens here in the sanctuary. You're invited to join in singing this song as the words will be on the screen as you wait to receive your elements. Come on, children, to the gospel feast. Gather round, gather round. All are welcome to the gospel feast. Gather round.
friends, this is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Let us eat together. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Let us drink together. With deep gratitude for these gifts, these decadent gifts of brownie, of pork, of pomegranate juice, we give you thanks, O oh God, that you have poured your love into us. May we pour your love from us now into the world. Amen. You may be seated. As we transition to the time to share the life of our congregation, I am excited by the number of things going on, so buckle up. First, special welcome and thanks to any guests and visitors who are joining us. I invite all of you to join us next door in the fellowship hall for snacks and refreshments after the service. And again, for those of you who might be joining us on Facebook Live, please also consider joining us on Zoom, where we have a community that gathers for conversation and fellowship after the service. Next, thanks to all of you who give financially to our congregation. There are a number of ways that you can do that, including the QR code in the bulletin, online via PayPal, or at the box in the back. On the first Sunday, when we celebrate communion, we also encourage people to consider donations to the Deacon's Fund. If you're not familiar, the Deacon's Fund helps us as a congregation respond to people who have various needs, whether that might be things like rent or PG&E bills, etc. It helps us help people in need. So please consider as you're able uh, that as well. You may have noticed that Jerry's, Pastor Jerry's listening group was going to be meeting today, but they are going to need to reschedule that. So they will be meeting next Sunday. Her listening committee is comprised of Linda and Stan Clausen, as well as Anne Duick. If you have anything that you would like for them to discuss next Sunday when they meet, please pass that along to one of the members of her listening committee. Tomorrow, Sewing Peace will be having their next gathering. For more information, you can talk to Marlis or Joyce, but I know they are hard at work on making comforters for MCC's Great Winter Warm-Up Campaign. I think I have heard they're going to have about 25 comforters to devote to that. And in next week's service, we will have a special blessing of those comforters along with the representative of MCC to say a little bit more about that campaign. So stay tuned for that. Also in the week ahead, on Thursday, my listening committee will be meeting. The members of my listening committee are Janice Lepke, Lynette McIntosh Madrigal, and Gary Barber. If there's anything that you would like them to discuss with me, please check in with one of them and do know that your comments can remain anonymous if you'd like that. Thursday of this week, EPU is also holding their next neighborhood market. The Central California Food Bank truck gets here about 12 or 12.30, and we can use help anytime from that point until we run out of food, which usually is about 3 or 3.30. So if you can make it anywhere in that window, we would love to have your help. If you're interested in something like a food distribution, but that time doesn't work for you in light of your work schedules, uh, our friends Mike and Karen McKeever over at Mennonite Community Church also hold food distributions the second and fourth Saturdays of the month. I've talked to them and they would welcome our help. So if any of you are interested in this and helping out another sister, partner, sibling congregation in the Valley, check in with me and I can get you some details on that. 
We have lots of Lenten activities coming up to look forward to, and I will only highlight two of them for now. There's others that you can look at in the Wednesday email. But for now, on Tuesday, February 13th, will be our Fat Tuesday uh, event. We'll have a pancake supper at 6 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. If you're interested in attending, please sign up using the RSVP in the Wednesday email, so that way we have a sense of how many pancakes we're going to need, and I think also sausages and some eggs too, so it'd be a wonderful meal. The next day, Ash Wednesday, is uh, February 14th, and we'll have a number of opportunities for you to receive ashes. In particular, we'll have three different opportunities, one at 7 o'clock in the morning, another at noon, and then another at 7 p.m. So lots of different options if that is something you are of interest, interested in. Next, on February 25th, save the date, it will be the return of the chili cook-off. If you are interested in putting in a chili to compete with others to see who might dethrone the current champions, I don't exactly know who they are. Oh, Pastor Audrey says she's one. I don't remember who the others are. Normally we have one for meat and one for veggie chili. I don't, yeah, so we've got one who claims to be the reigning champion. See if you can dethrone uh, <laughs> Pastor Audrey. It'll be a good time. Finally, we will be transitioning to a time of sending in just a moment, and I want to draw our attention to a special sending of one person in particular, Lynette McIntosh Madrigal. Go ahead and invite her and Al Duick up at this time. Many of you know that Lynette is involved in a variety of leadership roles here at the church. She is a member of church council. She, along with Stefan and Al, have been part of a gathering of young adults under what they've been calling theological kickbacks, and she also agreed willingly to serve on my listening committee. She does a lot here around the congregation, and she has been invited to Mennonite Church USA's Hope for the Future conference, and that brings together black, indigenous, and people of color leaders within Mennonite Church USA. And it's not just that she's been invited, she's giving a paper to that conference on Generation Z. So we've invited Al to offer a special prayer of blessing for her as she travels to and then participates in this conference. To bless you. You are delighted to do so. Creator God, your image inhabits our souls, and we reflect your image in wonderfully diverse ways. We confess, however, that we have often failed to see your face in the stranger. Lynette, you are among those who have hope that in the future, black and indigenous and persons of color will be truly seen and celebrated. We see God's image in your infectious joy, in your love of Jesus, and in your yearning for justice. You are a person who hopes for peace, gives forgiveness, and seeks understanding. May you speak with humility and confidence in the talks that you give. May you be empowered to be prophetic and gentle, patient and curious as you build new relationships. May you experience God's presence as one of the leaders of our Young Adult Initiative. Blessings upon you. Amen. I invite all of you to stand and remain standing for the benediction. But first, let's sing number 377, New Earth, Heaven's New. is new 
Spirit of God, moving new strength, hopefulness, new spirit of life, moving new heart, spirits, new image of God, moving. Sing a new song to the one who has said, things new. Receive now this benediction. May the grace, the real felt presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God that will not let you go, and the warm, wide embrace of the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and give you peace. Amen and go in peace. <laughs>